In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As you have heard, the Lord spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, and he told him that he had come down into the land for this reason, because he had heard the cries of his people, because he had heard their affliction, had seen it. 400 years they were in slavery, 400 years they cried out, hoping for mercy, and the Lord saw every one of those years. He heard every one of their cries, and now at last he had come to bring them out. The shepherd cannot lead out the sheep unless he fends off the wolf. David cannot save Israel unless he strikes down Goliath. The Lord cannot lead his people free until he deals with the tyrant. And so Moses goes to Pharaoh. Four hundred years they were in bondage under Pharaoh and under the Egyptians, and it would have been one thing just to be slaves in a foreign land, But they were in service not just to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians, but to their gods. For Egypt was not a land that worshipped the Lord, by no means. Full of idols, everywhere one looked. Temples and shrines, false worship, false teaching. And all the Israelites, subject and slaves, not only in their labor and in their bondage, but in service even to that corrupt nation and to their gods. Well, the Lord desired to show to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians what it meant to serve these false gods. And if there was any truth to these things that they worshipped, it certainly wasn't the true God. At best, if they were true, if they were real in any way, then they were serving only demons. They were serving only the false powers, only what Satan himself would have them serve. Well... If the Egyptians thought that worshipping these false gods would give them fresh water, would give them fruit of the earth, would give them health and prosperity in the land of Egypt, they had forgotten where these things truly come from. They had forgotten that the earth indeed is the Lord's. And so the Lord desired to show them what it means to actually serve these false gods. Pharaoh, with all his rage and his bloodthirstiness, Desired to kill the sons of Egypt, uh, the sons of Israel, that is. Desired to cast their children into the Nile. Well then, if you are so bloodthirsty, Pharaoh, I'll give you blood to drink. And out of that water, the frogs will come up. It will cause your land to stink. They will ruin your homes and your food. And if you want to press down my people into the dust, then that dust will rise up against you as gnats and flies, disease and sickness And finally then, what we heard tonight was just the seventh and the eighth of these great plagues. And as terrible as they are, it honestly makes us a bit squeamish. It's hard to stomach that there were ten of such horrible disasters to fall upon this people. But now you hear that the Lord shows his wrath against Egypt now also in this way. Stretch out your hand toward heaven, he tells Moses that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man and beast and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. And there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, such as had never been in all the land since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field, man and beast, every plant, and it broke every tree of the field. All God was doing was showing them exactly what it meant for them to serve their false gods. And even in the midst of these plagues, still they did not repent. Still they did not turn to the Lord who actually has power over water and hail and tempest and disease. All the meanwhile, we're told, only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. Only amongst God's people, those Hebrew slaves, those dirty foreigners, the Egyptians hated them. They wouldn't mingle with them. They wouldn't mix with them in any way. They left them off in their horrible, dirty place. Well, now how does it look? How has the Lord revealed to them what it actually means to worship the true God? For there in the land of Egypt, amongst all of their idols and their temples, everything was in ruins. Everything was destroyed. Hunger and thirst, their livestock dead. And yet the land of Goshen even had light. That the Egyptians had not. 
And how beautiful and how pure and holy must the land of the poor, miserable Hebrew slaves begun to look to the Egyptians. Well, Pharaoh, faced with all of this, still does not repent. Still, indeed, he wants to serve his idols, most of all the one that lives within his own heart. Most of all, it's his power and his self-serving. He will not let them go. Indeed, when faced with the horrible reality that's before him, finally he's driven to make a confession. Finally, he's driven to admit some sort of sin. But he lies. He lies right through his teeth. Plead with the Lord. Take away the thunder and the hail. Take away the locusts. I will let you go. And he does not. He adds sin to sin, it says, and hardens his heart. Fear drove him to confess in some false way, only to try and get the punishment away from him. He's not sorry in any way for actual sin. He's sorry he got caught. He's sorry he got punished. He wants his Hebrew slaves back again and his land restored the way it was. But that's not how the deal works. Dear saints, You might have a little bit of sympathy for Pharaoh as you hear this reading. Yes, I know, he's the tyrant. He's the bad guy. But how often have you, too, fallen back into the sin which you have confessed? How often have you also returned once again to the very sins that you said you repented of, that you were never going to do again? How often have you found a little Pharaoh living in your own heart, rebelling all the same, falling back once again, over and over. How often have you cried out, this time I have sinned, the Lord is in the right. Forgive me just this once, O Lord. It won't be just once. It'll be twice and thrice and over and over, so long as the flesh is still in you. For redeemed though you may be, dear saints, forgiven though you are through the blood of Christ, yet the flesh still clings to you, yet the sin is still in there, the old man. And he keeps sinning over and over. You were once under the bondage of Satan, as all were when they were born, born under sin, children of wrath by nature, our Lord tells us. Now at least the new man lives in you. For indeed Christ came to redeem you and to grant you forgiveness, not only for you to return once more to your old sins, to return once again, but that there might be something new in you, something pure, something holy, even living alongside that remnant of Pharaoh still in your heart. And by that new man, you're able to see and look with your eyes and find the truth. For the Lord revealed to Pharaoh the truth about what that sin and idolatry looked like. Now he reveals it to you. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is in ruins? Do you not understand what these idols of yours will lead you to? They bring you no prosperity, even though you love them. These things that you would not want to give up if the Lord asked you. What is it? What is your idol? What is your choice? The thing that you would not want to let go, even if it meant suffering. What is it that you maybe even love more than the Lord himself? This thing will not bring you peace and prosperity. Indeed, idolatry will only bring you down to ruin. When our Lord set out to bring his people out of Egypt, first there had to be this great struggle. First he had to deal with the tyrant, the one who held them in bondage, in service to the false gods. First he had to deal with them. And dear saints, as I have told you, as this is your story, no less than it was the Israelites, as this is the story of your redemption, no less than theirs, so it is also with you. For as the Lord set out to work your redemption through his son Jesus Christ, he had to first take up the mighty contest, take up the battle against the tyrant who held you captive. Christ our Lord set his hand to the sword, set his arm upon him, and set his arm to the battle upon the cross. For there on the cross he did battle with the true tyrant. You are not in service to the Egyptian gods. You are in service to sin and to death 
and to shame and guilt and to the devil. And so the Lord has come to bring you out. The Lord has come to strike down the devil, to show him what it actually means to rebel against the Lord Most High and to set his people free. And in order to bring you up out of death by his great resurrection, first he had to wage the battle on the cross and even fall into death himself. For in this redemption, this greater exodus that the Lord brings about for you, he does not cast fire and hail and darkness and locusts upon the earth. He casts his great wrath instead upon his son for you. There, the fire and the hail fall upon our Lord upon the cross. There, it actually was dark. The darkness came upon it. And there, his own blood flowed down. Not to drown Pharaoh, but to drown the devil. To drown sin and to drown death once and for all. And so these great plagues, the great wrath of God that was poured out on Christ, is by his very death turned against death and the devil. So that now at the foot of his cross, death lies in the dust amongst the flies and the gnats. Death lies destroyed, broken down under God's wrath. And our Lord even was willing to give his firstborn so that you could be his new firstborn, brought forth out of death and hell. The Lord has done all this as he has said, so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. That you may know, that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson, how I have dealt harshly with the tyrant who has held you captive. How I have struck him down. Indeed, even as David struck down Goliath, as the shepherd strikes down the wolf that attacks his sheep, so the Lord is willing to fight for you and to bring you up out of bondage. The stronger man has come, bound the strong man, and led his prisoners free. Your saints, you have been brought out. You have been redeemed. It was an act of wrath, true, against the devil, against sin, poured out upon the cross of Christ. And yet that act of wrath is also the great act of redemption and the act of love. For never before in all of the earth from its foundation until now, has such an act of love been seen? Has such a redemption been accomplished? Indeed, Egypt is ruined. Death, hell, the devil and his kingdom lie in ruins. And you are brought out to go free. And now that you have been brought out, the time for repentance is not over. The time for returning once again to that cross is not over. Indeed, as that flesh still clings to you, as that Pharaoh still lives on in your heart, so evermore you turn back to that cross and let it reveal to you the true weight of sin. Let it reveal to you the true wrath which our Lord has against sin and idolatry. But all the more, let it reveal to you the great love he has, that he was willing to pour out wrath not upon you, but upon his own Son to redeem you from sin, death, and the devil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.